For the second retrospective Chats with Specialists videos, we want to focus on our participating dealers who found themselves locked down both nationally and internationally. Specialist in Vietnamese arts, Raquel Azran joined us from Tel Aviv on a video call to tell us all about her masterclass in curating her home. Hello everyone, I'm Raquel Azran and I specialize in Vietnamese fine art. For over 30 years, I've been exhibiting artwork in galleries and museums, and I'm often asked by clients and friends to advise them on hanging their own artwork. So today I'd like to share with you ideas and suggestions for displaying your paintings in your home. And we'll try and avoid the cliche term of curate. Let's start with your artwork. Your collection may be small or extensive. You may have several pieces by a particular artist, or individual works by different artists. Let's walk around my home and see various ways I've hung my collection, both in groups and individually. My strong conviction is that paintings should speak to one another, should carry on a visual and or thematic conversation on your wall. This conversation will draw you, the viewer, into an ongoing active appreciation of the artwork as opposed to installing paintings and then after a short period, becoming oblivious to their presence. I am very much in favor of salon style room hanging, as opposed to white cube start placement of one piece per very large wall. Before hanging artwork, it's a really good idea to prop it against the wall where you're thinking of putting it. And if it's a group of works, laying them out that way will allow you to shift them around and try different options before doing the actual hang. Over the sofa here, you see four works by three different Vietnamese artists, Vu Tu Hien, Ding Ti Ta Phong, and Phan Cam Tour, all contemporary and based in Hanoi. The paintings share the medium of watercolor or ink on paper, a similar color palette, and all are figurative. Note that the figures in the paintings are facing each other or facing out to you, the viewer. I've taken advantage of the ceiling height for the placement of the different sizes. Notice also that some of the works are framed floating to show the rough edges of the handmade paper. Here we have another group of four paintings, also by Hanoi-based Vietnamese artists. This time, however, a mix of mediums, both watercolor and mineral color on handmade paper and lacquer on wood, which is the traditional Vietnamese technique which was perfected as a fine art medium in the 1920s in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts de l'Andorchine, or Fine Arts Academy, founded in Hanoi by French colleagues of Matisse. Note also the different types of framing, as well as the option of no frame. Framing should always set off a painting, but never overwhelm it. Note the minimalistic frame size and style here and throughout. There's a shared color scheme here, and placement ensures the figures are again in conversation among themselves or facing you into the room. Here you see, strangely enough, over the kitchen cabinets, another group of paintings, all by the same artist, Arya Lubin. As Lubin's work focuses on oriental figures, the works are thematically connected. Note the recurring arabesques and triangular shapes. And although, although the works are in different mediums of well different sizes, I have framed them identically in a very minimalist white frame. Uh, here you see a pair of works together, works on paper by Johann and Simon from the 1950s. They're framed similarly and they're hanging together above each other, set off by Zaritsky's 2002 bronze sculpture of Sancho Panza's donkey. Here we have another pair of lacquer paintings on wood by the Vietnamese artists Ding Hang and Ching Tuan. Again, no frame, same ceiling height, and speaking to each other on adjacent walls. When installing individual work, some important points to consider are the size of the wall and the size of the painting. Here are works by Lu Kam Yan and Nian Phu Nian, wonderful Vietnamese painters from previous generations. You'll note the same top frame height throughout as a way of tying together the collection. Good. I hope our short time together today has given you some fresh ideas about how to rearrange the artwork in your home. 
From modern Vietnamese art to centuries-old Chinese textiles, Jacqueline Simcox invited us to her London home to view a spectacular silk brocade. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Simcox, and I'm a private art dealer working in London, and my speciality is Chinese textiles. And these are silk textiles, mostly made for the court, and I myself like the early ones, varying from about the 13th century to 17th century. But of course, there are wonderful examples of imperial costumes dating to the 19th century and fine embroideries and weavings from that time as well. So this is a fragment of silk brocade, and it comes from the Ming Dynasty. That's from 1368 to 1644. And I suppose this is from about the middle of the dynasty. And it would have been a complete bolt of silk um, that's of about 12 meters long. And it was a very, very popular subject at the time. What it shows here is a repeating pattern of boys in very elaborate fur lined winter robes riding on white goats. And across each of their shoulders, they're carrying a branch of prunus blossom. And there's a small birdcage hanging from the branch. And so this is a play on words altogether. The whole subject is known as usually showing either three or nine goats. So let's say the three goats welcoming spring. So here we are, the black ground showing the depths of winter. And we're looking forward to the longer days of spring and summer and the return of the sun. So the boys are riding white goats. And in Chinese, the word for goat is yang, and that's also the word for sun, but pronounced mm. in a different voice tone. So here it is, the idea that you're looking for the return of the sun. And of course, in China as well, it's customary to keep small songbirds in cages. Mm. And the minute it's warm enough, you'll find that men take their birds in their cages outside and hang them up in the trees. Mm. So that's another sign of spring. And then the, finally, the prunus branch. Now, this is one of the earliest flowers of spring. We look at the cherry blossom and the almonds. Prunus trees in general are the first flowers that come out. Mm. And so this has a charming message to it. So what would this have been originally used for? Was it purely decorative or would they have made garments? Well, there are a couple of forms. If we're looking at this subject as a picture that you would hang on the wall, then it's in picture form. Of course, in China, most pictures were mounted as scrolls and kept mm. rolled up. So you'd unroll it to show it to friends or to admire it for a while and then roll it up and put it away again. But this, as it was a bolt of silk, was most probably made to be cut up and it would be used as furnishing fabric. I don't mean it would cover chairs, the sort of th that sort of thing, but it might well be used as a hanging appropriate to the season um, and hanging to go on either side of a door or to maybe be put into um, a, a cushion, something mm. like that, sure. and used at the right season. Sticking with Chinese works of art from the same century, a dealer in Chinese ceramics, sculpture and works of art, John Berwald, showed us two works from his collection. Hi, I'm John Berwald. I've been dealing in Chinese porcelain for the past 30 years or so, and our main speciality is 17th and 18th century porcelains, and hard to tang pottery. And I can see you've got um, a piece next to you on your right. This actually is an area which we very much specialize in and is my favorite area. Uh, I have here at home a very sturdily potted Chinese porcelain brush pot. And this was made in the 1640s during the transitional period. And this period encompassed the decline and the eventual fall of the Ming Dynasty to the invading Manchurians who were to establish the new Qing dynasty. Now, during the decline of the Ming dynasty, the Kilns lost their main client, which was the Ming imperial court, whose orders for porcelain ran into the tens, if not hundreds of thousands. And at this time, the Kilns then became privately owned. And the first task of the new Kiln owners was to find a new client base they had to fill the order books up. And although they had some exports that went to Japan for the tea ceremony and to the West, it was to the home market that they turned for their new client base. 
Now, at this time in China, literacy and education was at an all-time high. And so was the printing of woodblock books. And these books, woodblock printed books, were of Taoist tales, Chinese historical novels, and so on. And the illustrations in these books served as the inspiration for the designs we see on the porcelain at the time. And this occurred as a perfect example, because here we have the famous story of Journey to the West, one of the most famous Ming novels. And there's the monk Tributaki with uh, the, some of the animals we've always heard of, piggy and monkey. So as you can see from this design, this is a very home market object. Now, interestingly, the artists who painted this had previously been painting the Ming imperial porcelain, which became rather rep repetitive in manufacture. And this must have been very exciting to them. All of a sudden, they could really use their artistic skills. And they devised in the 1640s the techniques I'm going to point out to you, which helped us date it to that decade. What they did was they used these, what we refer to as V-shaped grasses. I don't know, can you see them there? They served to give the figures in the scene a footing, so they didn't look like they were floating around. This monumental shaded rock work was to give depth to the scene. And then interestingly, as you can imagine, if it's taken from a woodblock print, a print has a left and a right hand side. And to preserve that, they gave the pots a back with these cloud banks. So it's almost as if you can visualize the print wrapped around this porcelain canvas. Now, of course, the brush pot, which had been previously a wooden object, was a perfect shape for this sort of design. And if we look on screen now, we can see another shape which was actually invented at this time to serve this purpose. You're looking at what was known in China as an elephant foot vase. If you look at this vase, we can see on there another very Chinese taste subject, and it is the famous Zhongkui. And Junkui is the queller of demons and ghosts. And there's a little picture there of a demon who is tamed, who is pulling along his rather reluctant deer. Interestingly, after the 1640s and when the kilns eventually came back under Qing imperial control, these shapes disappear and they were only used at this time. Now, I'd just like to explain a little bit more about the client base, because this consisted of two very different groups. One were the rich merchants, and they were making a huge amount of money in the Jiangnan region, which had very fertile land. You know, they were big landowners, and they also had the monopoly on the salt trade. So this was a, a hugely wealthy group. And this group thronged the urban centers like Suzhou and Shanghai, where they rubbed shoulder to shoulder with the other group, which were the Chinese literati, the scholar elite the people who, if you like, were the civil servants of the empire for over a millennium. And it's fair to say that the scholar elite resented the rich, wealthy merchants coming into the market. They were the nouveau riche of the day, and they were upsetting the balance. And this is where you get a little bit of a mirroring in what's happening today. The supply in the market had no chance of meeting the demand. And as we know, when that happens, fates enter the market. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to finish up just by reading something to you. I'll just grab a bit of paper here mm. by Sao Chang Hu, who wrote this at the time that the brush pot was made. And he is in Suzhou, which was one of the main marketplaces for antiques. In old Suzhou, at Changmen, the city gate, many shops stand in rows like fish scales. Amongst the most numerous are antique shops. People in high places are so proud of their connoisseurship. They will keep on buying with all the money they have. How many authentic antiques can there be? No wonder the market is filled with forgeries. From Chinese art to Indian modernist painting, Grosvenor Gallery have been based in London since 1877 and have long been respected for a source of both well-established and emerging artists. In June, we caught up with gallery director Charles Moore. He told us about the fascinating story of a recently acquired painting by Sousa, which had in fact been sold by the gallery about 50 years ago. My name's Charles Moore, 
and I'm one of the directors of Grosvenor Gallery in London, and we specialise in modern and contemporary works of art from South Asia. So I saw online that um, Grosvenor Gallery recently acquired a quite special Raza painting. We did, yeah. That was quite an that was quite an interesting story in how it played out. Mm-hmm. Um, we bought it at auction, a nice watercolour by by this Indian modernist painter Raza, and we got it back. Took it out of the frame and discovered that there was quite a lot of writing on the back. Um, in the course of researching the work, we discovered that it was exhibited at the first major exhibition of the Bombay Progressive Artists Society, oh, yeah. um, which took place at the Bombay Art Salon in July 1949. So this is just two years after Indian independence. So really the early days of sort of India finding its own voice in terms of its arts, its culture, that sort of thing. Um, and not only was this painting exhibited in that seminal show and that is a word that you can be used for that mm. show i mean the importance of it was enormous um it was also exhibited on the front cover of the catalog <laughs> which only a handful of paintings were which was quite an amazing discovery and something we had no idea about when we bought the picture it's just you know a really wonderful thing to, mm. to find out because often sometimes these things pass you by you know you handle things and, and you don't have any idea but it was we were very lucky to find that out. Um, funnily enough, we've actually we actually bought another of the works on the catalogue as well. So we yeah. found we have found two out of the six. So we're we're trying to you know we've got a bit of discovery still to do, but hopefully we managed. Yeah, to it's do like reassembling the uh, original collection, exactly. <laughs> which we leads us it. nicely onto the work you've got isolating with you, um, the Sousa drawing that we can just see over your shoulder. Yeah. Um, so that is a drawing by uh, another Indian artist, Francis Newton Souza, who was the founding member of the Bombay Progressive Artist Group, who then invited Raza and Hussein and, and a few others to join in 1949. Um, later that year, he left India and came to London and for some years really struggled to get anywhere really in his career as an artist. So he had a really tough few years and in 1954 was on the verge of... Um, jacking it all in, going back to India. Uh, He said that at least in India, he could sleep on the street and eat rice to survive, whereas London, the weather was so bad and everything was so expensive. Um, And just before he was about to leave, he got a big break, had had an exhibition in Paris, and then that led on to other opportunities, eventually culminating in a show at Gallery One, run by Victor Musgrave in uh, early 1955. And 55 is kind of the the, the big year for Sousa and, and generally regarded as the, the peak of his, not the peak of his career, but one of the best years mm-hmm. of his artistic output. Um, so this is a drawing from 1955. Um, it wasn't in that show, but I found it in America a few years ago and um, was very happy to buy it, got it home and then I was playing through the old gallery records a few months later and came across a sales tag with the description, a man and woman at table 1955 and it turned out that the two works had been bought from the gallery in 1967 mm-hmm. by a man called Martin Summers and then what 45, 50 years later I found them and bought them back and only once once we got into the UK, discovered that that they'd done a full a full circle yeah, and come really, back to yeah. where it originated from. So yeah. I thought that was really lovely because I love the I love the story that accompanies pictures. You know, it really makes them come alive yeah. rather than just being sort of objects in themselves. I think that human connection is really important, and yeah. that's what it certainly interests me about about working with things like this when you come across a story like that. Mm. So is it um is it ink on paper? Can we um can we take a closer yeah, yeah, look? Of course, yeah. Let me do this. Yeah. So, so it's ink on paper, and it shows a man and a woman seated at a table. Sousa is known for his portrayals of uh, nude females and of male figures, sort of reminiscent of Christian iconography and Catholic stained glass windows and Catholic saints. Mm-hmm. He was born in born in Goa uh, and brought up a Catholic. So, these subjects often appear in his work. But this is a, it's a really detailed uh, example that survived in, in really good condition, I guess, as a result of being in a collection in New York for, for 50 years. Sure. 